When Leonardo da Vinci died, he left behind thousands of pages of drawings and notes, including a series of startlingly accurate anatomical sketches that lay essentially undiscovered for several hundreds of years. To coincide with this year's Edinburgh International Festival, a new exhibition at the Queen's Gallery at the Palace of Holyrood House presents Leonardo's exquisite anatomical studies alongside state-of-the-art modern medical imagery, revealing just how close this Renaissance genius got to the truth that lies beneath the skin. Leonardo shines out as somebody who made enormous strides in his field. He's thinking as an engineer, trying to understand the mechanism of the body. Are you doing okay then? Fine. It's absolutely accurate. I find that quite poetic that he's used movement to illustrate something anatomical. It gives you a depth to these drawings, which is technical genius. We tend to think of Leonardo da Vinci as a painter, but for the majority of his life, he was also a scientist, designing robots, studying the properties of water, endeavoring to understand the secrets of flight, but the scientific field in which he most excelled was that of human anatomy. Leonardo first began to research the human body to help him keep his paintings as true to nature as possible. But the project soon took on a life of its own and he filled hundreds of pages of his notebooks with detailed sketches. Leonardo's aim was always to publish an illustrated treatise on the human body. But tragically, he never did. Today, all of Leonardo's notebooks are scattered right across the world. And perhaps surprisingly, almost all of the anatomical ones are amongst the Royal Collection's greatest treasures at Windsor Castle. The weird thing about them, is that for hundreds of years, the fruits of Leonardo's research were essentially lost. There's a wonderful story that the drawings languished for a very long time in a royal bureau until the wife of George II, Queen Caroline, chanced upon them. The reasons why they ended up in the royal collection are slightly complicated. Towards the end of the 16th century, the sculptor Pompeo Leone bought a load of Leonardo's papers and carved them up, sometimes literally, into different albums, including one that consists of about 600 sheets. This was probably acquired by Charles II sometime after the Civil War. Curator Martin Clayton is allowing me a rare glimpse of these delicate works here at Windsor Castle before they're packed away and transported to the exhibition in Edinburgh. Did people in Leonardo's lifetime know about the anatomical drawings? Yes, but it's not the same as actually understanding their content. Um, until anatomists came along in the case of Hunter in the 18th century and then in the 19th, 20th century, nobody really understood the content of this material. They knew they were impressive, but they didn't know why they were impressive. There can be no other scientist whose work was as profoundly insightful as Leonardo's was that has had so little impact on his chosen field. A significant date for him, really Martin has selected four different drawings from the notebooks to give an overview of Leonardo's anatomical career. The first one dates from 1489. What's astonishing about this is how beautiful a presentation this is. To take the front off one half of the skull and juxtapose the two sides so you can see the depth in relation to the surface features is a brilliant demonstration of the internal structure of the skull. I find it quite odd to get my head around the fact that this is a real sheet that was drawn and annotated mm -hmm. by Leonardo da Vinci. His yes. hand, 500 years ago, <laughs> did touch this paper. The next one is from when? It's from probably the spring of 1508 and he describes observing the death of a centenarian he's performing a post-mortem. If you go carefully, you can say Equesto Vecchio. Vecchio is the Vecchio, old man. the old man, exactly. Di poche ore innanzi la sua morte, a few hours before his death. Why did he use mirror writing? I think it was simply easier for him. It was left-handed and it was easier for him to pull the pen than to push it. If we fast forward sort of two years... Oh, just a couple of years, yes. ...then we find this kind of sheet. 
Yes, um, this is from the winter of 1510-1511 and he's conceiving of these as a sequence of illustrations getting deeper and deeper as he takes away individual muscles and the density of observation and the quality of presentation that you see on this sheet is of a different order compared with what went before. This final image is one of the most famous drawings Leonardo yes. ever produced. It's one of the few sheets of Leonardo's in which he's using any colour. The red chalk leaps out at you from the page. And that red, this rather startling use of red, gives the fetus a sense of, of life that is possibly even lacking in some of the other sheets. Perhaps I'm feeling especially susceptible at the moment because I'm about to become a father for the first time, but that red chalk drawing of a fetus curled up in the womb is such a ravishing, heart-stopping thing. It seems to wriggle before your eyes. And every single one of those sheets is similarly animated by the alacrity of Leonardo's thoughts, because each one jostles and teems with observations and ideas and reflections, a bit like the fossilised remains of someone's synapses firing on all cylinders half a millennium ago. Leonardo's anatomical sketches may now be among the treasures at Windsor Castle, but he first began work on them here in Milan. He came to the city as a fully-fledged artist around 1482, and the years that he spent in this part of Italy would prove crucial. He arrived here to work at the court of Ludovico Maria Sforza, the ruler of Milan, whose nickname was Il Moro, or the Moor, on account of his swarthy complexion. And I love this one particular detail that has come down to us in the sources. It says that Leonardo arrived brandishing this beautiful silver musical instrument, a lyre, which he'd fashioned to resemble a horse's skull. It was a wonderful advertisement for his ingenuity and his many different talents. Working for Ludovico gave Leonardo the freedom to try his hand at many different things, from architecture to engineering. The Biblioteca Ambrosiana houses Leonardo's biggest collection of mechanical drawings in the world. Kept in a vault beneath the streets of Milan, the Codex Atlanticus, as it's known, is made up of more than 1,000 sheets from Leonardo's notebooks. They cover a range of staggering subjects, from military weapons to canal systems. There's even a draft of the letter that Leonardo wrote to Ludovico to get his job. I wonder whether maybe you could translate a little bit and tell us what Leonardo is actually saying in the letter. Well, for example, he affirms that he is good in building bridges. Bridges? Bridges. Ponti. I can build bridges, light and strong. Does he talk somewhere down here about actually being an artist as well? Well, about music, entertainments, and many, many other aspects of uh, his, uh, his capacity. So in this next drawing here, this is an example of the kind of engineering project that he took on. Well, you can see here how he is uh, organizing and building the gate for different canals, and finally... Uh, as well as all his engineering work, in his spare time, Leonardo's serious interest in anatomy had been growing. And a few of these anatomical drawings are also tucked away here in the collection. I wonder whether there's much correspondence between the mechanical drawings and the anatomical studies. Sometime he tried to combine both because in his point of view the human body is a most perfect machine. Initially, anatomy was a way for Leonardo to make his paintings of the human body more effective. To start with, his knowledge wasn't based on first-hand observation, but on speculative classical literature stretching back to Galen and Aristotle. This meant that Leonardo's drawings of the human body weren't always anatomically correct. But his inquiring mind asked questions about the human form that had never been asked before. 
The breakthrough came at the end of the decade when Leonardo inscribed the head of a page in a new notebook on the second day of April 1489, later adding book entitled On the Human Figure. And in the pages that followed, he executed this exquisite series of drawings of the human skull. They were meticulous, they were lucid, they were very precise, and they were clearly made from first-hand observation. Finally, having greater access to human material gave Leonardo an enhanced understanding of anatomical structures, lending his drawings scientific credibility. But of course, it wasn't just about observation for Leonardo. He was also an excellent draftsman. So what I'm going to do is take the skull off for you and ask you to make a series of studies of it upside down. I want to find out how Leonardo articulated his understanding of the body through drawing. So I'm back in London to meet artist Sarah Simblit. What do you feel you've learnt from Leonardo's anatomical drawings? It's been a huge point of reference in that I've learnt technically the use of pen and ink from him. Um, I've learnt very much about uh, the way in which he uses drawing to see and understand structure and form, the way that he uses drawing as an investigative tool as well as a means of thinking and expressing himself. What was Leonardo's technique when it came to making the drawings? He's worked probably with a steel dip pen. When you press it down onto the paper, then two pieces of metal will splay apart, and by undulating the pressure, you can change the, the thickness and the expression of your line. You've obviously looked at his drawings a great deal over the years. In what way are they distinctive compared to other anatomical drawings? Well, he's thinking as an engineer, and he's trying to understand uh, the mechanism of the body, the mechanism of life. Uh, whereas an awful lot of artists have looked at the surface and wanted to be able to render muscular form and the power of the living body, uh, Leonardo actually wants to get inside and understand how it works. And you don't find other artists um, working in that way. So he was a true anatomist. Despite the breakthrough with the skulls, Leonardo put his anatomical investigations aside for a decade or so and went on to other things. For Mercurial Leonardo, this meant anything from designing the Dome of Milan's cathedral to painting one of his masterpieces, The Last Supper. But his latent enthusiasm for anatomy resurfaced around 1504, and in later life, these studies took up more of his time than any other single activity. The Royal Collections exhibition, Leonardo da Vinci, The Mechanics of Man, at the Edinburgh International Festival, has brought together a huge range of Leonardo's anatomical drawings. And there's one series in particular which has never been shown in the UK in its entirety before. Anatomical Manuscript A consists of 18 sheets on which Leonardo crammed more than 240 individual drawings covering almost every bone in the body and many major muscle groups. Here we see the superficial anatomy of the shoulders and of the neck. And you see the same model who's been very sensitively drawn, sort of rotating in space so that we as the viewer get a full articulation of something that's 3D, even though the drawing obviously exists only in two dimensions. And the series continues right down to the bottom of the sheet where you can see the skin has disappeared and underneath, here are the muscles and the tendons laid bare so that Leonardo's not just observing how things appear in one static sense before his eyes, he's always thinking about how things exist in reality, in our world. He's trying to articulate the functional side of anatomy. In this series, Leonardo uses static pictures to capture beautifully a sense of physical movement. Every pose has been cleverly chosen to best highlight each muscle group. Dancers, more than any group of people, have a keen awareness of their bodies and how they physically function. I've come to a rehearsal of the Scottish Ballet to talk to their artistic director, Christopher Hampson, about Leonardo's skillful poses in Manuscript A. 
I find it interesting that he's using movement to further identify muscle groups or ligaments and how far perhaps the joint will move. I find that quite poetic that he's used movement to illustrate something anatomical that could have been quite dry. Christopher has found a unique way of bringing Leonardo's poses to life. Do you think we should introduce the semi-naked man that we've yeah, suddenly sure. had with This us? is our principal dancer, Eric Cavallari. Um, he's going to help us out just uh, in recreating these images. So this is the first example. What have you chosen? Well, I've chosen uh, the shoulder and the arm. I've chosen it because it's actually quite a balletic pose anyway. Because of the, the way that the arm is drooped, we call this allongé. So you can see his arms outstretched. And Eric's automatically put his head looking down at the arm, which you can kind of tell that's indicated from the way the neck is inclined down towards the arm. It's not sort of snapped this way. It's got a slight bend, which you can see he's got there, so that all the muscles are, are well defined. That's where I find these drawings so interesting, is I feel he's used rotation and shaping to make sure that the correct muscles stand out. Ah, so now why have you picked this? So this one again, because it does have a sense of movement to it, so the arm is in what we call a fifth position. So Eric, if you can take fifth position and incline the head, and that gives us this shape. Um, again, just by making the, the forearm rotate in towards the head, um, makes the bicep ping out and ignite. So again, it shows the arm much more clearly. So this is what? This is your third example. And what's happening here? He's showing how the calf muscle gets fired up, how it ignites with movement, I presume. But then he shows this, which is the foot on a high, what we call three-quarter point. You can see immediately mm. that the calf muscle gets fired up. It is a marked difference. Yeah. The gastrocnemius is what it's called, serves to raise the heel. This muscle becomes hard in pulling up the heel as well as releasing it. Yeah. Well, we've just seen that. You've seen it perfectly. Yeah. Leonardo's sketches are remarkably succinct and accurate. And he was able to convey all of this simply through drawing. And now, the Royal Collection's Leonardo exhibition in Edinburgh is doing something rather innovative. This is the first exhibition that compares Leonardo's anatomical discoveries made simply using a scalpel and a pen with sophisticated modern medical imaging techniques like CT and MRI scans and also 3D films. And it's quite staggering to reflect that even though today's anatomists are using contemporary technology. Many of their conclusions are similar to those reached by Leonardo in the far-sighted drawings he made 500 years ago. I want to put this idea to the test, so I'm going to do a little experiment. And I must admit, I'm feeling a little apprehensive. This is an MRI scanner. Medical technology doesn't get much louder or more sophisticated. Are you doing OK in there? Fine. I'm glad you're there. And it's going to scan my hand so that I can compare the results with one of Leonardo's anatomical sketches that he made in the winter of 1510. OK, well done there. So uh, that's all finished. I've survived. You have indeed. Well, I got through that. Um, I've still got a little bit of tingling, pins and needles in my, my left arm, my hand. It is bizarre in there. It's like being in a futuristic Stanley Kubrick-style film set nightclub, and you're bombarded by this relentless techno. Um, I kind of went into another place, another zone. But I'm glad it's done, I'm relieved, and I think it's time to get out of my smock and my gown. So, talk me through what we're seeing here, because even though we've got all of this 21st century technology, these are still mm -hmm. quite complicated images. Mm -hmm. Can you talk me through what we're looking at? Absolutely. These straight lines here are the muscles coming up. The white areas here are the blood vessels. And over here, so we've got the bones over here, which are dark on this picture. I brought along a reproduction of um, one of the most famous anatomical sheets by Leonardo of all. 
This was done probably in the winter of 1510. Wow. And it's actually startling looking at it it's compared to these images. Looks absolutely accurate. Here are all of these tendons radiating up, up towards the fingers from the wrist. And there we can see them, a sort of bundle there. It's amazing how accurate he was able to draw it. You can see all the different bones that he's got. He's, a, he's done it absolutely correct. Because this is just a knot of complexity, isn't it? Yeah, so these are all the bones in the wrist which give us all of the movement and things that we were able to do with our wrist. It's interesting looking at this because it almost seems like an aerial shot of parched earth or something. <laughs> but the thing that's brilliant about these drawings is that he manages to take something that is clearly so complicated mm. and make it lucid and clear in a sheet done 500 years ago. To achieve this level of accuracy, Leonardo not only had to be an excellent draftsman, but also he had to be handy with a scalpel and have direct access to human bodies. In the course of his anatomical investigations, he only dissected about 30 corpses. And around 20 of these were carried out whilst he was compiling Manuscript A, probably collaborating with the Veronese anatomist Mark Antonio della Torre in the medical school at the University of Pavia. I've come to the anatomy department at Glasgow University to see a human dissection. What I hope is that this will help me understand Leonardo's achievement in these drawings by witnessing the complexity of what he himself would have observed. We're going to try and imitate one of the, the famous lower limb drawings that, that Leonardo did and give you an idea of how um, complex the tissue is in real life and how, how good a job he actually did. The really big difference between the modern era and Leonardo's time was that he obtained bodies either legally through the church and maybe from the pauper's house and these sorts of things, whereas in the modern age, every one of the people that we, we use in here is donated willingly and knowingly in, in their actual life, they've signed the forms themselves. So we're just moving on to the dorsum of the foot where we'll see the tendons starting to become more prominent. So these are the things that were really standing out in Leonardo's drawings. It's much more pronounced in Leonardo's drawing than it is in reality, where here, you know, if you didn't know what you were looking for, you might miss that altogether. Yeah, well, it was really testament to, the, to the, the skill of Leonardo that he could take something that was so difficult to to discern from, from the tissue and, and make it so clear. So you can actually see on the underneath, there's each tendon, which is what, the thick band, the thick white band. Yeah, so there's one It's of, not the internal, the bit in between. No, these bits, one of each of these for each which toe. Which goes straight to the toe. They're a collection of strings or ropes that are connected to the muscle at one end and to a, a bone at the other. Quite remarkably, Leonardo not only captured them wonderfully well in terms of his drawings, but quite clearly understood the mechanical purpose of them. Mm. And imagine Leonardo going through this dissection and not just standing here and looking at it as a static um, example, but pulling on the tendons and moving things around. It's so clear to me now that Leonardo did something really quite remarkable in the drawings by creating a system to articulate that in a clever, simple, plain fashion. Leonardo's combined skills as a dissector and draftsman meant that he would glean insights that would not be observed again for hundreds of years. The full scope of his scientific accomplishments can be seen in the field of cardiac anatomy, which he carried out towards the end of his career. Intrigued by the way that the aortic valve opens and closes to ensure that blood flows in one direction, Leonardo set about constructing a model, filling an ox's heart with wax. Once the wax had hardened, he recreated the structure in glass and then pumped a mixture of grass seeds suspended in water through it. This allowed him to observe little vortices as the seed swelled around in the widening at the base of the aorta. And as a result, and this is the extraordinary thing, Leonardo correctly posited that these vortices helped to actually close the aortic valve. And that would not be observed again for hundreds of years until the 20th century. One contemporary practitioner who studied this side of Leonardo's work 
is the heart surgeon Francis Wells. The first time I really focused on the drawings was when I just qualified as a doctor and I was doing my anatomy for surgery. And once I'd seen them, I thought they were far better than anything we had in a current day modern textbook of anatomy. They were beautiful, they were accurate, and they were absorbing, and there was a liveliness to them. You can look with a magnifying glass at some of the drawings of the interstices of the heart, for example, and the fineness of the shading. It gives you a depth to these drawings, which is technical genius. What did he find out about the heart? First and foremost, and it may amaze you to realise it, that the heart was thought of as a two-chambered structure up until and after his time, because, of course, he never published this. The two ventricles were the heart. The atria, the filling chambers, were regarded as part of the venous system, not part of the heart. Leonardo firmly stated the heart has four chambers. I did bring along a reproduction of a drawing that Leonardo made in which he observes these so-called vortices. This is a beautiful example of synopsis in thought. In it, he's got the hypothesis for the flow, a uh, description of the vortices, and at the top, little diagrams showing how this argument has to be the right one for the mechanism of closure of the valve uh, and not simple reflux of the blood and how it would fail. Now, this wasn't known about or understood until the last century, and it was shown most beautifully and reported in Nature in 1968 by two engineers in Oxford, Bellhouse and Bellhouse. And there's one reference, and that is to Leonardo da Vinci. The reference is 500 years old. The tragedy of Leonardo's anatomical investigations is that he never got round to publishing them. It was almost as if he was constantly getting sidetracked with all his different projects. The abrupt death of his collaborator, the anatomist Marc Antonio della Torre, from the plague in 1511, coupled with political turmoil in Milan, also cut short Leonardo's systematic efforts to finish his treaties. When he died in 1519, the hundreds of sheets and notes that he'd compiled over three decades remained hidden among his private papers. If Leonardo had published his treatise on anatomy, then he would have been considered one of the great scientists of the Renaissance, if not all time. But he didn't, and because of that, his startling anatomical discoveries essentially disappeared from view for hundreds of years. They didn't have much impact on the history of science. So what a curious thing this is, to dominate a field so thoroughly, and yet for the fruits of your research to wither into oblivion for almost four centuries before blooming back to life. You can see masterpieces of the great Venetian Renaissance artists on the Your Paintings website at bbc.co.uk slash yourpaintings.